Welcome to the Capital Forum's interview series. My name is Sally Hubbard, and we are delighted to have Barry Nigro here with us today. As background, Barry is a partner and chair of Freed Frank's Antitrust Department, where his practice is focused on investigations and litigations under federal and state antitrust laws. Previously, Barry served as deputy director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, where he managed the Bureau's merger and anti-competitive practices, investigations, and litigation. Barry, thanks so much for joining us, and let's dive right in. Thank you, Sally. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about were the recent, somewhat recent, 2010 revisions to the merger guidelines and the increased emphasis on telling competitive effect stories and less, less emphasis on defining market share. How have you seen that play out in your practice? Well, I, you know, in, in my practice in dealing with the agencies, um, we've always told the competitive effect story. It, uh, it's rare to go in and start talking about product markets and geographic markets. Uh, I think the agencies are interested in understanding the market dynamics and, 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 and it's much more natural and effective to, to, to tell a story, explain who the players are, how, how competition in, in the market works and why the competitive process will continue to be as robust after the merger as it is before the merger. So the guidelines in, in 2010 really didn't change, in my view, how we practice antitrust law in front of the agencies. Um, they did, however, articulate the way the agencies uh, analyze mergers differently from the prior guidelines. And, and I think one of the challenges for the agencies is to uh, what will be to see how the courts, you know, how readily the courts uh, adopt some of those changes. So you've said it hasn't really changed um, how you deal with the agencies. Has it, has it changed how you deal with the courts and antitrust litigation? Well, one, one of the issues that, uh, that people focused on when the guidelines were first uh, published was market definition mm -hmm. and the de-emphasis of market definition. The 92 guidelines started with market definition. The 2010 gui guidelines sort of take a more holistic approach to right. looking at competitive effects. And, and so while they didn't completely excise market definition from the analysis, they did de-emphasize it. And, 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 and so that, that, that was a concern for some people. Mm -hmm. However, the fact is that all of the recent court decisions uh, involving merger matters uh, have focused on the traditional brown shoe type of market definition analysis. If you look at the Lundbeck decision, um, think about Staples, which was before the 2010 right. guidelines, obviously, and more recently with the, the, the H&R Block mm -hmm. case. Uh, the department and the FTC um, did not ignore market definition and the courts in particular have, uh, have continued to apply the, you know, the market definition uh, analysis to, you know, to, to, to their decisions. Do you think the FTC and DOJ should be trying to move the courts along further in the direction of uh, focusing on competitive effects over market shares? I, 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 think, I think it's hard to, to put a premium on, on, on one factor or another when you're looking at, at mergers. So while I think the, the, the bottom line is what is the competitive effect and how will consumer welfare be promoted or in, uh, hindered uh, when you're looking at mergers, uh, I, I, I do believe that, um, well, a couple things. One, the statute, Clayton Act Section 7, does require you to define an effect in a line of commerce in a section of the country. So right. you can't ignore the statute. So you have to deal with that. And, and I think if there really is a competitive effect that's going to have an impact on, on some group of consumers, um, you ought to be able to describe who they are and what it is and where it's going to occur. So I don't think you can completely ignore it, but I, I, I do think what, what the 2010 guidelines are trying to do is, is say, there's a lot more to antitrust than just defining a market and, and, and adding up the market shares. And particularly in some of the fast-moving markets, the innovation markets, I f it seems that the competitive effects uh, analysis might be more appropriate because the market shares are so unstable um, as, as industries are evolving. I mean, have, do you think 
Uh, have you seen that as an advantage of the competitive effects analysis? Well, if you um, so if you look at the high tech markets and the rapid change that that, that occurs in in those types of industries and and, and some of the challenges uh, that are presented with network effects, mm -hmm. um, it, it is hard to try to fit that into a uh, market definition, market structure analysis. I think it's really important to look at the di dynamics and what's happening in the market and, and, and to understand um, what's happened in the past as, as, as a, an indicator as to what might happen in the future, but don't let that be a limiting factor because um, you know, one of the challenges for the agencies and the courts is to try to figure out whether the, the merger may substantially lessen competition. That's a forward-looking exercise, right. but all of the factual evidence that they look at is backward-looking. Right. And, and so if you're just going to engage in a backward-looking exercise that's focused purely on market structure, you'll probably get it wrong most of the time in, 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 in an industry where there's rapid change. So looking at competitive dynamics, looking at trends, looking at the, 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 the way competition occurs in that market, who are the customers, who are the suppliers, um, you know, what's happening in, with intellectual property, all of those things need to be taken into account so that, so, so that the analysis uh, is, is more holistic, so to speak. And what role do you think that internal company documents should play in, that, in the merger analysis and kind of putting together the story? I think um, th there's been a lot of uh, talk about, you know, uh, hot documents. Right. The FTC in their data release um, even looks at the likelihood that your transaction will be challenged based on whether there are hot documents or not. But that's not the only factor that, 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 that the agencies or, 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 or I think the court should should look at. Um, there, there are other factors. I think documents are obviously important and to the extent that documents are inconsistent with the types of arguments you're making with respect to the co competitive dynamics, I think that raises a red flag. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think the documents should dictate the outcome one way or the other. I think it, it's, it, it, it's a piece of evidence that needs to be considered along with customer complaints. Uh, along with competitive dynamics and, and, and everything else that, that, that you know, and the likelihood of entry, all of those things need to be considered as a whole. And, and, and so, you know, while the agencies, I think, have uh, learned from past experience that it's important to tell a story when they file a complaint and that the contemporaneous business documents can be a very effective way of communicating that story, the documents by themselves are not going to win the case. There's going to be more to it. And, and I think from the defense perspective, documents by themselves won't necessarily lose the case. I mean, it's something you have to deal with. And I, and I think when you produce enough paper to the agencies, you're going to find documents that, that, that often that go in both ways, so in both directions. So, right. so it's, it's really important to, to look at the documents in the context of the overall, uh, the overall picture. Okay, so there's been an ongoing debate about what the goals of antitrust should be and how the consumer welfare standards should really be defined or what it really means. In your view, what should be the goal of antitrust, the primary goals? In, in my view, I, I think that the goal should be to maximize output, uh, maximize innovation, maximize low prices, maximize quality, all, all of those things together. Um, some companies tend to focus on, 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 on innovation, others focus on low price. Um, I, I think, I personally think that, that, that consumers are best when the market is left to decide um, who prevails in that type of an environment. And, and so, you know, I, I guess generally speaking, I, you know, I'm comfortable with the consumer welfare standard uh, a, a, as a principle, I know that you know the, 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 historically there have been the, 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 there have been laws that have focused on other values, mm -hmm. and that's fine. That that, that that's something that that uh, our our political system allows. But if you're looking at trying to maximize the wealth of of of, of the country, which is the sum total of the wealth of the individuals within the country, then I, I think consumer welfare is probably the best way to achieve that. 
And so it's not just about achieving the lowest prices for consumers, but also looking at you know maximizing output for producers as well. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think consumer. Uh, there are a broad range of consumers out right. there. So some consumers do care principally about low prices. Others do not. Others care about high quality. And, and there are consumers who value innovation. So when you look at new products that come out, and especially in the technology space and the excitement that surrounds mm -hmm. those products, some of them are very high priced, yet they fly off the shelves, right. people wait in line, they camp out overnight. Not, I don't do that, right. I don't value that, but you know, I'll wait, I'll wait a year. But, but there are, you know, I, I think you need to let the market decide and, and then let the, the suppliers respond to that demand and in order to sort of maximize the, I'll call it consumer happiness and consumer welfare, um, whether it's innovation, quality, uh, or, or price. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that people value, and, and, and I think letting the market determine the best mix of those things is, is, is in, in my view, the, the, the way to uh, maximize uh, uh, total welfare. And, and when you're saying um, let, it's best to let the market decide, what what exactly do you mean by that? I I, I think that um, you know when when if you if you put it in the antitrust context, when the agencies are looking at transactions or or conduct for that matter, I I think that they should be focused as I as I believe they are on preserving the competitive process. Right. And, and and that their job is really to protect competition as as a market dynamic as a process, not to dictate an outcome. Uh, so that uh, you know there may be there may be things that 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 the agencies think people should value, but but I think it's a process that's most important. Uh, so it sounds like. Uh the most important goal of antitrust from your perspective is preserving competition more than preserving, say, low prices for consumers. That's right, because I think if you preserve competition, you will get low prices if that's what consumers want, or you'll get high quality if that's what consumers want. You'll, 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 I, I think at least in theory and hopefully you get what the consumers are looking to, to pay for. And, and so I think preserving the competitive process is really from, in my view, the number one goal of, 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 of antitrust. And, and that's one of the reasons I, I, I enjoy the field is because it, it's, it's, about, um, it's, it's about the competitive process. And, and it's also, I think, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, if you think about uh, uh, politics of antitrust, I don't think there are a lot of politics in antitrust. Really? There are maybe on, on the margins, but... Um, I really think there's there's a, a, a fair amount of agreement. Really, that's a, that's a new perspective. <laughs> I, I I mean, an, the reason I believe that is yeah. because a lot of antitrust enforcement is based on on on, on, on principles of, of economics, mm -hmm. and those are principles on which I think there's a you know there's a fair amount of agreement, at least with respect to the fundamental points. Um, they're obviously sort of cutting edge issues where people have debate and, and, and on the margins there are always outcomes in particular cases that people may disagree with. But I think when it you know 90, 90, 95 percent of the matters that, that go through the agencies, I think the outcome uh, would be the same regardless of whether you have a Republican or a Democrat uh, in, in office. I, I, I don't think that there's a, a huge gap between uh, uh, the administrations when it comes to enforcement. I, I do think it matters to some extent which agency you're in front of. However. Right. Yeah, I was going to say with the FTC, perhaps maybe it matters more, do you think, because of the fact that they have the commissioners that have to vote for I, enforcement? I, I was actually going to say the opposite. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was going to say that because the FTC, by law, is a, a bipartisan agency. You have to have at least, uh, you can have no more than three, three members, commissioners from, from a single party. Um, they, they always have a mix. The decision makers are always um, a mix of Republicans and Democrats. You may have three Republicans and two Democrats. Mm -hmm. 
at some points, and, 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 and three Democrats and two Republicans. But it's a consensus-driven agency. They don't agree on everything, but if you look at their decisions, they agree on most things. And when they have five commissioners, it's often the votes are often five zero. Not not always, but but often. The, the antitrust division, on the other hand, I, I I think the enforcement there can has the potential to vary more than at the FTC because you have one AAG, and 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 there can be a dramatic a more dramatic shift uh, when there's a change in administration, especially in some of the areas like like. Uh, Section 2 enforcement. So this is an interesting topic right now because there's a current situation with the FTC where we have two Democrat commissioners and two Republican commissioners and uh, there's a lot of questions about whether there'll be a fifth, how long it will take to get a fifth commissioner and you know a lot of people feel that the fact that there's a, this 2-2 two -two situation is going to result in a lot of kind of 2-2 two -two deadlock and lack of enforcement since no enforcement action is taken when there's a 2-2 vote. In your view then, is that unlikely to happen? Is that not a concern? I, I think on, 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 on some matters there's, there, there's a possibility that there will be a 2-2 split, but I think if you look at what comes out of the agency you'll see that um, there's a strong desire among all four commissioners there now to have have a consensus. I think Chairman Ramirez is uh, hoping to uh, build consensus, and I think she's capable of doing that. So I, I, I'm willing to bet that on most matters that come out of the agency, you will see agreement among all four commissioners. Uh, I don't think there's going to be as 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 much of a divide as as people may may expect, but. Um, that's not to say they won't disagree on on, on, on certain issues. Um, you know, for example, I think on standard essential patents, which is a big area, right. there's clear disagreement between uh, some of the commissioner commissioners, and I, and I think that you know on those types of issues that will continue, and until a third a fifth commissioner is uh, is is appointed, um, you know, the, the FTC may be limited in what it can do in that in that space. What are the what are the clear disagreements on the standard essential patents? Could you explain that a little more? Well, there's you know there, there, there's a question um, you know I think Commissioner Allhausen issued fairly detailed statements in connection with mm -hmm. the uh, Bosch decree and, and and the Google matter, and I think in her in her mind there's a question as to whether the FTC has the ability to uh, to regulate uh, the the licensing of standard essential patents because of uh, the Nor Pennington Doctrine mm -hmm. and, 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 and other principles. So, you know, she expressed uh, reservations about having the FTC step into that space. On the other hand, um, you know, I think that's an area where right now there's a lot of agreement between the FTC and the Department of Justice, which has not always been the case. So. You know, while you may have some disagreement within the FTC, you have uh, agreement between the two agencies. Okay. Well, thanks you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to chat, chat chatting with you, and I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you, Sally.